Okay, what we are doing today really is not brain surgery, but it is very important. The theme that we are pursuing this year as a congregation is what? Running to win. Let's all turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27. If you look at those verses, you'll notice the Apostle Paul is talking about the Christian race, and he's talking about the things that are necessary to do in order to win. We're trying to emphasize the things that the Christian has to do if he truly wants to win the race. The first thing we listed from verse 24 is he has to run like there's only one prize that's going to be given. Now, is it literally true that only one person's going to heaven? No, but that's the way you approach the race. You approach it like there's only going to be one winner. From verse 25, it's a competition. We are not competing with each other. We're not trying to best the other person, but we are in competition with our own lust and with the devil. And finally, in the 27th verse, we're trying to run the race in a way where we don't disqualify ourselves. Stay in your lane. Do the things that the Christian is supposed to do. Uh, in a real race, can a runner be disqualified? It can't happen. In the Christian race, a runner can be disqualified, and <clears throat> really that's kind of what we're doing for the last couple of weeks. We're kind of flipping it for the, our purposes in this class, uh, and we are talking about those traits that would disqualify us. Uh, the things that we are trying to emphasize in here lay aside every encumbrance or weight and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance. We're talking about the weights. Uh, we are talking about traits that are weights or encumbrances. The things that would disqualify us. So far, and there wasn't any one text. We just pulled these things together for the purpose of discussion and thinking about them. But if you look at the traits that we have talked about so far, being sneaky, uh, being a quitter, becoming distracted, we talked about that last week, Martha. Uh, we remember about Martha, was she convinced that the Lord was going to see it her way? Yeah, she thought she was right and she thought the Lord would give her a thumbs up. Go ahead, you can ignore me, go ahead and cook dinner. And she found out she was wrong about that. Sometimes we might convince ourselves that this thing that I am doing is so important that I don't have to pay that much attention uh, to furthering my life as a Christian. And we might find out otherwise. Uh, and then finally, we got to the idea of the blind spot. Now, is it, for all those who are married, is it easier to see your spouse's faults or your own faults? Almost always easier to see our spouse's faults than our own. Can they see ours? Do we have blind spots, areas where something is obvious to the people who are looking at us, but may not be obvious to us? problem here. Everybody sees it but me. That was the problem with the rich young ruler. What was his blind spot? Money. He was greedy. You know, Lord, what do I have to do? And the Lord says, keep these commandments. And he very conspicuously omitted one, thou shalt not covet. Why omit that one? That was the blind spot. Uh, that was the thing that the young man was supposed to see. And it, he just, the Lord just almost had to take his face and stick it in it. You know, shove his face in it before the man was able to see it. And then when he saw it, he said, oh, I need to correct that. What did he do? He walked off sorrowfully. Because that problem that he could not see was something that was very deeply ingrained in him. 
Now, if you still have the lesson sheet called Losing Traits, the last ones listed on that sheet are the Pharisees. And let's go to Luke 16. It's funny because I was going to ask everybody, what's your blind spot? But I guess by definition, if it's a blind spot, you don't see it, huh? Ask your wife. Ask your husband. They might tell you. Now, with the Pharisees, does it ever seem like the Pharisees are always a target? If we talk about bad traits, does it ever seem like every time we look for somebody to be an example of something bad, we come back to the Pharisees? Why is that? Because they did everything wrong. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with what we're looking at now. <coughs> it's almost like if you take an arrow of bad traits and shoot it into the air when it lands, it's going to hit the Pharisee. I mean, even by pure accident, they are such an easy target. Now, in Luke chapter 16, Jesus has given the parable of the unjust steward, which is all about greed, like with the rich young ruler. Now, what's the Pharisees' problem with greed? They're lovers of money. They're all greedy. Okay, so Jesus comes out with a parable that says you ought not to be greedy. And what is their reaction in verses 14 and 15? Uh, Luke 16, verses 14 and 15. Joe, do you have that? Yes. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things, scoffing at him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Okay. For a moment, concentrate on the 15th verse. All right, Jesus has just given a lesson on greed. And lo and behold, what do they end up doing in verse 15? Their goal is to justify themselves. First reaction, uh, somebody comes up with something that might be a little bit critical of them, and their first reaction is to justify themselves. What does that mean? I'm going to justify myself. I'm going to make excuses. Whatever you say, however you criticize me, I'm going to say that I and what? I'm right. I'm right. I'm always right. And if you ever get to thinking that I may be wrong about something, just go back to rule one and say, I'm right. And I'm always right. Uh, this is what self-justification is all about. I'll give you 40 reasons as to why I'm right. And I will scoff at you if you suggest that I'm wrong. Now, just for a moment, I'd like for us to think about some of the ways or some of the tricks that the Pharisees would use to justify themselves and make it appear that they were always right. And we'll give you the first one because it's right here in the text. Look at verse 14. Uh, they were listening to these things and they were scoffing scoffing at him. Somebody says something about me that I don't like. Somebody suggests I'm a certain way and I don't want to own up to it, even if I am that way. I'll scoff at them. Give me another word for scoffing. We wouldn't say scoff. Nobody uses that word. Pardon me? Ridicule. Ridicule, Ridicule or... Or laugh. We're just going to laugh about it. Uh, I am the kind of person, if you suggest I am doing something wrong, I'm going to laugh at you like you are totally ridiculous. 
I will ridicule you. Is that uncommon? Very commonly used trait among people that seek to justify themselves. If you suggest I'm wrong about something, I will laugh at you for it. Pharisee did it all the time. Can you think of anything else? They did, but hold that for just a second. That's going to be the last thing we're going to say, because there's a special way they did it. Let's go to John chapter 7. John chapter 7 and verse 48. Now this is where they sent soldiers to take Jesus and the soldiers came back without him and they say, why didn't you take him? And they said, nobody ever spoke like this man spoke. And that creates a problem for them. Uh, Verses 47 and 48. Who has that? Who can I pick on? Uh, Jason, would you read that, please? Okay. That 48th verse. What are they doing? You haven't been fooled, have you? None of us have believed in him, have we? That is an appeal to what? Appeal to status. You must be wrong because I'm me. Don't you understand that I am so special that I can't possibly be wrong? You think something is true. You think this is the way things are. But I'm me. How, you, what, how ridiculous of you. Uh, If we likened it to something, simple example, Um, we come to a passage, just pick on Judy again this week. All right, Judy's sitting here and Judy says, I think this passage means this. And I say, no, Judy, I think this passage means this. And you need, and, and I'm me. So you need to believe me. Does that prove anything? Not worth a thing, is it? And yet in this passage, that is exactly what you're seeing by the Pharisees. You need to agree with me because after all, I'm me. And I have status. So naturally, I'm right. I will justify myself. First, I'll laugh at you. And if that doesn't work, I'll say, wait a minute. Don't you know who you're talking to here? I'm me. And something else. Let's go to Matthew 23. And keep in mind, this is all about self-justification. We play these little games because it just would break my jaw to admit that I was wrong about something. Uh, In Matthew 23, it is the sermon where he absolutely scorches the Pharisees. Verses 16 through 22, we pointed this out many times, but it is always worth looking at. Uh, Can I ask for a volunteer to read? Matthew 23, verses 16 through 22. Ken Simeon, would you read that, please?
Okay. What are we looking at here? What kind of argumentation? Stupid argumentation. A blind guy can't lead the very no, this is nonsense argument. It makes no sense. All right, you look at what is said concerning the oath here. Whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing. Whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he's obligated. Does that make any sense at all? That's the point. So why do they make the argument? Are they really looking for what is right or are they looking to justify themselves? I take an oath, I swear by the temple that I'm going to pay you this amount of money, and then I decide I don't want to pay you this amount of money. So, oh, wait a minute, I just swore by the temple. I didn't swear by the gold of the temple. I'm not paying. You know, brought this up in Bible class one time. You remember when you were kids, somebody would say something, and, and you'd say, I had my fingers crossed. That's what this is. You come up with a nonsense argument to justify yourself. In their hearts, do you think they knew it was a nonsense argument? You think they would have taken that argument from somebody else that owed them money? So why do you throw a nonsense argument out there? Because I'm right. I can't be wrong. And if you think I'm right, just remember rule number one. I'm right. Uh, you know, justifying oneself. If, if you look at the ways this is done, again, you laugh, you appeal to your own status, you make a nonsense argument. All in an effort to say, I'm right, I can't be wrong. Now, if we think about the person that has this problem, do you know someone who's always right? Anybody here know somebody who just always right? Can't be wrong about anything? Um, being honest, looking up at the screen at, at these problems, let's put this one up there. The tendency to justify oneself. You can raise your hand on this one. Is there anybody here that has a slight tendency toward that? If you're not raising your hand, you're not telling, you're justifying yourself. <laughs> There's a little bit of that in all of us. You know, I want to be right. Uh, so there's a little bit of that there. So when does it become a problem? When you're wrong, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know how you know you got a real problem with it is when you try to laugh it off when other people say things or well I'm me or you make some kind of a dumb argument and in your heart you know it's a dumb argument because you just can't tell somebody that you've been wrong about that but all of us have that to a little bit of degree now if, if a person has a real problem that person you were thinking about a second ago do you know somebody that's like this that's just always right uh, turn to James 5 for just a moment Th this is a problem yes Yeah. If we cannot legitimately justify ourselves, then we turn to those things you have listed on the board. Yeah. We attack our opponents. So yeah. But, but justifying oneself can be. Did Jesus justify himself when he was right? Well, he was always right. When I say when he was right, I imply he was wrong. He was never wrong. 
Yeah, it is a good point. Is it okay to make your case for yourself when you are in the right? We start this out in Luke 16. And, and yeah, we will point this out. In Luke 16, when this whole question started, were the Pharisees right or were they wrong? They're wrong. And this is the problem. I'm wrong. And I still fight tooth and toenail to say that I'm right. Now, uh, when we look in James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, here's the real problem with dealing with somebody that just has to be right all the time. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The problem of the guy that has to be right all the time. When you stop and you think about it, here he is. I'm right. And every time you approach me to say I might be wrong about something, I'm going to throw all this in your face. After a while, what do you not want to do anymore? Don't want to talk to him. Don't want to talk to her. Uh, very difficult person to deal with because, you know, I know what's going to happen here. This is a person that just continually says, nope, 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 I'm right. Now, and I'm, I'm not trying to insert my nose in anybody else's marriage. This is just something that we bring up because it happens often enough that it needs to be said. In marital relationships... Does this cause, sometimes cause a problem where one of the partners just has to be right all the time? And these things come into play. After a while, what happens? It is not worth talking about. I don't want to talk to that person about it anymore. And so what happens to the relationship? It just deteriorates. I mean, uh, sometimes it might last because, you know, you okay, I'm in the relationship. This is what it is. But it is extremely difficult to deal with a person that just cannot say I was wrong about this. Yes. Yeah. If you look at Matthew 23, that last sermon to the Pharisees, let's flip back there one more time. When you look at that, have you ever read that sermon and, and just realized that this is the biggest blister job anybody ever got in the Scripture? I mean, he walks into Jerusalem and just, and he does this publicly in front of everybody. And he just rips them on several different accounts. Have you ever said to yourself, well, maybe Jesus went a little bit overboard? That's, it would be a silly thing to say. But I mean, that is just so hard. Why would you be so hard on these guys? I mean, obviously they are wrong, but what kind of a person are you dealing with? He's, I'm going to laugh at you. I'm going to say, I'm me. I don't have to listen to you. And I'm going to throw out some ridiculous argument that makes no sense at all. But I will not say that I'm wrong. How do you deal with that person? Usually you don't. Matthew 23 is kind of like last ditch effort to get somebody's attention. Yes. Yes. Propaganda. You go look at German propaganda from World War II. Very well spoken. 
Uh, say somebody got up to say, well, you know what? Here, here's what we're going to do. I mean, we intended to abort this baby. So if the baby is born and, and survives the birth, we're going to snip its spinal cord. Will you find people that make eloquent arguments for that? Yeah. And it's still nonsense on the surface. Uh, there, to a degree, with the human race, anything that is well stated, people will tend to believe it's true. I mean, if you can say it eloquently, if you can state it well, it must be true. Until somebody comes along and very eloquently says, no, here's why it is not true. But this, this concept here, the self-justification, uh, very bad problem. You know, again, we say there are times when we are justified because we have done and spoken that which is right. The problem comes in when somebody says, even when I am wrong, I'm not wrong. And I'm going to make it look like I was right. Now, these are traits. You know, we've got five up there. Sneaky, quitters, distracted, blind spot, justifying self. Any other traits you can think of that if we had a lot of time that we would just keep throwing them up there? Because there's a lot of them. We just tried to hit some of the common ones. The, the one that, as bad as self-justification is, the one I'd look at is quitters. You know, the concept that I'm throwing in the towel because something is not making me happy. Because once you quit, you know, you cross the line. I mean, it's not that you can't repent, but when somebody says, I quit from that moment forward, he's got some real repair work to do. Now, what I'd like to do now... Um, Hopefully, a lot of you still have churches of Asia in the book of Revelation. We passed this out last week. Does anybody need a copy of that? We, shall, we have about 30 extras here. We shall have them. Where did I put them? Yeah, if, Ted, if you could distribute those, kind of spread them around, I would appreciate it. We have been talking about individuals. Now we are going to be talking about congregations. For a moment, now here's my special artwork. That's the best I can do. Did I not pass those papers out last week? I'm wrong. How's that? <laughs> Neither did I pass them out the week before. Does anybody have them? Or does anybody have them? Listen, I'm me. I think I'm right about this. So. <laughs> you didn't get it? All right, we can make more copies. I'm sorry. They'll have me committed any day now. While we are passing that out, take a look at that well we put up on the screen. That is a well, a well of water. Can a congregation of God's people, we'll use this one. Can a congregation be likened unto a well? Can the comparison be made? You got water, living water, Jesus spoke of. And when you think of going to a well for a moment, um, why do people go to a well? To drink. John chapter 4, Jesus is at the well and he asked the woman, give me a drink. Uh, we drink. We are refreshed. We might even rest. Jesus was resting at the well. In ancient time, uh, this is in ancient times. What were wells also used for? Unless you know what I'm thinking, you never get it. Gathering place. 
people kind of gather together to, to meet each other, to talk. You know, if we think about the well in ancient times, you know, something to drink, the water available, you rest, you associate with the people that you live with in the village, or just a lot of things that you can say about a well that you can correlate with a congregation. Now, a well is not the only place to get a drink of water. You can get a drink of water in your house if you got the water there. But when you think of congregation, I was talking to Phyllis one time, you know, and this was several years ago. And, you know, we were talking and the question was asked, well, you know, why do some people come here as opposed to someplace else? And Phyllis said, because they get fed here. Or what if she, it would have been just as accurate to say they can drink here. Uh, do we come here to drink? Okay, so the congregation is like a well. We come here to drink. Uh, do you get refreshed here, hopefully? Better able to face the week that's coming. Do you find it restful? Hopefully. Uh, spiritually, it should be a resting place. Do you come together and associate with your brethren here? Yeah, when you think of a congregation, it, it's kind of like a well. Now, up on the screen, you notice something, a question. Is it possible to poison the well? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. First Corinthians 11 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul is going to speak about the way they were participating in the Lord's Supper in Corinth. And he starts out in verse 17, but in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. Is it possible for Christians to assemble and conduct things in such a way that things get worse instead of better? That's called poison well. If you've created an environment where things are making Christians worse instead of better, then you've poisoned the well. Have you been a part of a congregation where you kind of got the feeling when we come together, this isn't making people better. This is tearing people down. Most of us somewhere along the line have seen that. You know, this is not improving things. This is making it worse. Somehow, some way, the well has been poisoned and we've got to figure this thing out or it's going to be a major problem. Um, when you look in the New Testament, are you given views of different congregations where the well seemed to have been poisoned a little bit, or a lot? What's the first one you think of? First one you think of is Corinth. But just start going through the letters, Acts, Romans. The Roman congregation seems to have been in pretty good shape. Not much is said negative concerning the Roman congregation. First and second Corinthians. Poison well, good well. That well's going really bad in Corinth. First and second Corinthians. Galatians. Poison well, good well. Bad well. They got problems in the Galatian churches. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, the prison epistles. Those congregations seem to be in pretty good shape, but they are given warnings concerning what's coming. First and second Thessalonians. How's Thessalonica? 
First Thessalonians, pretty good. Second Thessalonians, do you see some problems coming in? First and second Timothy. Well, that's to an individual. Titus talks about the congregations in Crete. Are there some problems in Crete? You come to the general epistles, you know, problems coming in concerning Gnosticisms. Uh, a lot of times when you read the letters in the New Testament, this question of the poison well comes up. Either there are congregations who have poisoned the well or the issue is, is on the horizon. Now, first we think of Corinth when we think of poison wells, but we're not going to Corinthians, we're going to the seven churches of Asia in Revelation. Let's turn over there. The poison well. And after Corinth, this would probably occur to us first. Seven churches of Asia. There are only two of which nothing negative is said. We are going to concentrate on the five uh, that show us, well, some sources of poison. Now, you may see this a little differently from me in that you might read a description of one of these churches and you might say, well, this occurs to me about that group. This occurs to me about that group. So different things might pop up and that shouldn't surprise us. But there are some things on the surface that make it clear. This is a poison well and this is the reason. Now, the first one we notice is the church in Ephesus. Let's read verses 1 through 7. Uh, Revelation 2, verses 1 through 7. Nate, would you read that, please? Okay, church at Ephesus, a lot in the New Testament about the church in Ephesus. A lot of very positive things, but also a lot of warnings given to the church at Ephesus. We remember that Paul called the Ephesian elders and said, out of your own number, men will arise. Now, he could have been talking about the eldership, or he could have been just talking about, you know, that particular eldership in Ephesus. But when you look at what he just read here, can... A congregation have a lot of good traits and still be an overall failure? Possible? Yeah, we, we look at Ephesus. We look at verses 2 and 3. The good traits that did not poison the well. What were the good traits in Ephesus? Verse 2, your deeds, your toil. These guys were workers. Uh, perseverance. Verse, uh, what else? You, you tested those who call themselves apostles. They tested, they would not tolerate evil men. That sounds pretty good so far, doesn't it? They didn't put up with a bunch of foolishness. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake. And you have not grown weary. Boy, you talk about a great trait. That is an outstanding trait. How many people or how many congregations can you look at and say, you didn't get tired? That's fabulous. 
So you got all this going for you. Okay, so what poisons the well? Verse 4. Here's the well poison. What they do. You left your first. You left your first love. Several different ideas about what that could be. Uh, I can think of two or three that would fit. Maybe they all fit. And maybe all uh, are part of it. Uh, a lot of times people left your first love. That means they became legalistic. I got a, I got a pet peeve. My pet peeve is people talking about being legalistic. Um, usually when we talk about legalistic, people want to define that as you're really scrupulous about trying to keep God's law. From a Bible point of view, would that be legalism? Being scrupulous about trying to keep God's law? What are these guys doing? They're being scrupulous about trying to keep God's law. When we talk about legalism, essentially we're talking about acting like a Pharisee and trying to manipulate law to get what I want. To twist things around. Uh, I, legalism, I, I wouldn't put there because there are a couple other pretty good options. Does anybody have one? What does it mean, leave your first love? Love for Christ, but how would that be manifested? I mean, these guys are working like crazy. They're serious Christians. What do you mean, left your first love? Uh, a couple of months ago, you know, in a, in a sermon or in a class, I can't remember which, we, you know, we, we used this and kind of put out a guess and said, maybe this is spiritual PTSD. Uh, post-traumatic shock. What sometimes happens to soldiers when you bring them back from the battlefield? They can't let go of the war. They just simply can't let go of the war. They're in fight mode. And in some ways, they're kind of dangerous. Hard to be around. That's all they can think about is the war, even when the setting doesn't dictate it anymore. Could there be such a thing as spiritual PTSD? when you look at what you're seeing on this side of the board. It's all fight. Fight, fight, fight. Is it possible to develop a love for the fight? I just love a good argument. Actually, I don't. But... Are there brethren that, you know, I'll fight just for fighting's sake because I love it? Uh, this is the kind of thing that we think about a little bit. I just can't shut it off. Sometimes a great strength can become a weakness. Illustrate it this way, what we're talking about. For you World War II buffs. Japanese Zero, great fighter plane. Well, when the war first started, the Zero was a great plane. What made the Zero so good? What could it do? It could do just exactly what the pilot wanted it to. It was fast. It was maneuverable. It could climb. Great plane. We didn't know what to do about that Zero. What made it so fast and maneuverable? It didn't have any armor. And so in just a little while, we had half a dozen fighters that were bigger, as fast, had armor, and about three times the firepower. And then somebody figured out if you put one bullet into that zero, it's probably going to go up in flames. Great strength, maneuverable. Maneuver maneuverability but it turned into a weakness 
Okay, great strength. Great strength, this side of the board. But is it possible that some of these traits overcome a person so much that it can become a weakness? We'll come back to that next week.